Welcome to our 9 a.m. press conference. We're a little after 9, sorry for the delay, a bit of technical, difficulty, technical difficulties and speaking difficulties. Um, okay, so this press conference is about fire and a changing climate and what we can do about it. We have four speakers, and in order of their speaking, we have Louis Giulio, Research Associate Professor at the University of Maryland, College Park, Maryland. Christopher Williams, he's Assistant Professor of Geography at Clark University in Worcester, Mass. Doug Morton, Physical Scientist with NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. And Xiaowen Lin, Graduate Student Researcher in the Department of Earth System Science at the University of California, Irvine. Our speakers will um, all speak and then we'll open the floor to questions. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for attending today. Uh, fire has been a pervasive agent of change on the planet for millennia. Uh, while it originated as strictly a, a natural process, it's, it's now decidedly anthropogenic in most parts of the world. On a global, global scale, humans now start most fires uh, for, as a tool for forest and brush clearing, crop and pasture maintenance, um, fuel reduction, cooking, hunting, charcoal production, and various other activities. And then there are also wildfires uh, that occur each year, and these are started usually by lightning or by humans accidentally. And these are the ones that we often hear about in the news. Now, it's long been understood that fire is an important ecological process that influences uh, many attributes of community, including um, species composition and plant productivity. But the realization that fire plays a significant role in climate change uh, emerged comparatively recently, basically since some studies uh, in the late 1970s. And fire has uh, very many roots, actually, in which it can affect climate, but probably the most important is by transferring large amounts of carbon stored in vegetation or biomass uh, into the atmosphere, and doing so rapidly, uh, and uh, in particular as the greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide and methane. So it's consequently important that we monitor fire activity worldwide completely or as completely and consistently as possible. And really the only practical way to do this is with satellites. And so fortunately over the past 10 or 15 years, uh, we've had satellite data and we've gotten the best picture of, of global fire activity we've had uh, since that we've ever had before. So much of the progress that I mentioned Comes about, came about because we now have high quality data from NASA's MODIS instruments. There are two of them uh, imaging the Earth as we're sitting or, sitting or standing here today. Uh, and with MODIS, we can see fires with high fidelity and with very good coverage. And I think I use the word monitor fires. I want to clarify what I mean by that. Really, two things. First, we can detect fires as they're actively burning, as in this shown in this image. These are deforestation fires in Bolivia. But we can also map the cumulative area burned uh, on the landscape after the fire's over, and that's shown in this example from Africa, where the different burning dates are shown as different colors, uh, and the extent of the burning is, is truly remarkable. Now, with the global view provided by satellites, again, at this point, primarily MODIS, we can piece together uh, broad patterns and begin to look for trends. Um, for example, we could start here in the U.S. and track the progression of fires during the past year. This is 2012 up until um, a few months ago. I, I don't actually remember this, the end date. And here we primarily see in the West, we primarily see wildfires. These are mostly in forest. In the southeast, you can't really see them now, but they'll ramp up momentarily. Those are mostly prescribed fires. These are mainly um, to reduce their, their low intensity surface fires, mainly to, reduced, to reduce uh, litter for fuel management. And then finally, you can see cropland fires in the south and in the north and even into Canada, the Dakotas and into Canada. And these are ma mainly um, fires to remove agricultural waste. So 2012, 2012 has been a particularly big fire here in the U.S., which is something we're seeing more often. And I'll come back to that point in just a moment. Uh, so looking over longer time periods, we can begin to distinguish trends. So I'm going to show a couple of re results now from something called the Global Fire Emissions Database, uh, which, is, uh, which includes a burned area record 
assembled primarily from MODIS observations. So this is the annual trend in burned area for Africa below the equator. And here we see a noticeable increase. Uh, the slope doesn't look uh, too startling, but keep, bear in mind this is about 2, 2 or 2.3 million hectares per year. That's just about exactly the area of the state of the size of the state of New Jersey. And most of this is due to changes in precipitation. Now here in the U.S., we also see a very noticeable increase. And I want to point out that the, uh, the point for 2012, the red dot there, that incl only includes burning through August. So we won't have uh, numbers for the, the rest of the year for another month or so, but by all indications, 2012 will likely exceed all the other years we have that I show here. So I want to note, too, that this type of long-term fire monitoring will only become more important as the climate changes and uh, certain regions prone to fire become drier. So for the, the rest of the subsequent presentations today, uh, we're going to have a more detailed look at some of the fire trends we've already observed here in the U.S. We're going to have a look at some of the projections of how climate change could alter the fire landscape in the U.S. in the decades to come. And then finally, we're going to look at different types of fire across the U.S. and what we can do about them in terms of management. Thanks very much. Hello, my name is Chris Williams. I'm from Clark University in the Department of Geography. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Satellite-based mapping of burned area across the western U U.S. has noted a dramatic increase over recent decades. What our study has shown that I'll be presenting on today is the magnitude of carbon dioxide emission associated with this increased, in increased burn area and how that has risen in step, in lockstep with the rise in uh, area burned. This graph, this bar chart, indicates the area of, uh, affected by fires from 1984 to 2008. This is based on the monitoring trends in burn severity, and it's, an, it's a sum over all areas burned by wildland fires and prescribed fires recorded in this database. Those are large area fires, approximately 400 hectares and larger. This is again produced by the Monitoring Trends in Burn Severity pro Project. We've seen a 2.5 times increase from the first half to the second half of this record in the total area burned in these western states. This image is meant to just give you a sense of the detail with which satellites can map burned area. This is a false color image based on the advanced land imager from Earth Observing 1, a NASA satellite platform. Um, this, the image source is from Earth Observatory, available on NASA's website. This citation is here. The green colors show vegetated areas. Red indicates areas that were burning, or that's, excuse me, burned in the Whitewater Baldy Fire in New Mexico that occurred in late spring and early summer of this year, of 2012. What was remarkable about this fire is that it was the largest fire on record for the state of New Mexico. This map then looks at the burned scars or the burned area from 1984 to 2008 for the full span of record available when we were performing our study. It indicates the spatial distribution, the different colors indicate different time periods over history. What we set out to do was to quantify for each fire the carbon release associated with direct emissions as well as the slow decomposition of fire killed biomass plus the gradual regrowth of carbon stocks associated with each of these fires. One thing that makes our study unique is that we emphasize not just the direct emissions associated with combustion of fire but also the biomass killed and how that decomposes and is then released to the atmosphere. And furthermore, the rate of regrowth of forest stocks following fire, so that post-fire regeneration and recovery. To do this, we compiled a comprehensive set of observations from uh, the literature, from the scientific literature, to best describe in a model the impact of fires of different severities. And we used the model to calculate this. This is a map of the carbon balance impacts of fires that were just mapped. The red areas show places where a recent fire has resulted in prompt carbon emissions associated with these two sources. The green areas indicate places where the regrowth of vegetation stocks of carbon are overwhelming that slow decomposition uh, that was set off by the burning, by the biomass burning. We're also able then to assess the trend 
in burned area and how that translated into carbon emissions. And that's what's shown in this graph. We see from 1984 to 2008 a dramatic increase also in the carbon emissions, the carbon dioxide emitted as well as other carbonaceous species through direct emissions as well as biomass killed. And there are two points that are important about this set of slides. First, that the direct emissions are only part of the story. If you look at the magnitude on the bars on the y-axis, the vertical axis, we see that direct emissions spans to 20 teragrams of carbon per year, whereas the biomass killed spans to 40 teragrams of carbon per year. So really, you have to consider not just the direct emissions through combustion, but also the slow decay and decomposition of fire-killed biomass to take full account. The other important thing is that we observe a 2.4 times increase in the emissions imposed by fires over this period. That is, from the first half of the record to the second half of the record, there's been more than a doubling in the carbon impacts of these fires. And to put those numbers into context, I want to now compare across a variety of different disturbance types affecting forests of the western U.S. We're going to compare beetles, fires, and harvest. And one point to make is that fires have risen to affect an area almost as large, or um, four out of seven times as large, as that of harvest, where harvest has previously been thought as the, the major player. The other thing is that beetles are affecting uh, a very large area. However, a lot of this is a diffuse impact. We can translate that into the carbon impacts. And here we, we see that that diffuse impact of beetles reduces the magnitude of carbon emission, whereas fires are approximately 30% of the total carbon impacts of disturbances, um, carbon releases of disturbances. Some of that is offset by gradual regrowth and an ensuing recovery of forests, but that can take decades to a century. The recent increase in burned areas associated with increased spring and summer temperatures as well as reduced snowpack, and climate change forecasted for the region suggests that uh, we can expect a continuation of this trend. This map illustrates the compilation of all the active fires from MODA sensors from January to October 31st of this year, and it just again underscores that 2012 was a record year for burned area. And I just want to end with this image from the High Park wildfire that occurred in 2012. Uh, more than 200 um, homes were affected, more than 2,000 firefighters were involved, and tens of millions of dollars were associated with this large fire in Colorado. Again, underscoring how 2012 puts us right on track with keeping with the fore what's forecasted for uh, climate change and ensuing uh, fire impacts. And so now NASA's Doug Morton is going to tell us about the likely future that, of fires that we can expect um, with ensuing climate change. Thank you. Thank you and good morning. One of the important advantages of having these long-term records of burned area derived from NASA satellites is that we can start to look at how the changes in fire activity on a year-to-year -year basis match up with changing climate conditions. So in one of our recent papers, our group tried to examine how the climate conditions in each of the different U.S. regions, and here and throughout my presentation today, I'll use regions that were developed for the National Climate Assessment an ongoing evaluation of how climate will impact both human and natural systems across um, the U.S. Our goal was to understand how different regions and how fire in those different regions respond to climate um, over the record where we have our satellite record. And so in these two images, we see on the top panel our measure of the climate dryness. Here we use potential evaporation um, to understand how the variability in fire activity is, is strongly linked to climate uh, on a seasonal basis across the United States and most of North America. On the bottom panel, we see the trend or the increase in dryness over the same time period that we have satellite data. And as Chris and Lewis have mentioned, what we see right now is a coupled increase in how climate has made the U.S. more susceptible to fires and a concurrent increase in burned area over that same time period. And so what our group has done with uh, lead authorship in this upcoming work from Dong Dong Wang from the University of Maryland is to examine if we look forward using climate projections developed for the fifth assessment report of the IPCC, these newest climate projections and this relationship between climate dryness and fire activity, can we assess how fire activity may change as we move into the middle and end of the coming century? So 
So what we've done, again, using the regions developed for the National Climate Assessment, is to evaluate how two different climate scenarios, a low emission scenario and a high emission scenario, might change the atmospheric dryness or the risk uh, of fire activity across different regions of the United States. What we see under this low emissions em scenario um, is an increase uh, across the United States, especially in the key regions where fires today are most pervasive. And those are in Alaska, the Plains regions of the Midwest, uh, the Northwest, and the Southeast United States. So as we look across this low to middle emission scenario, we see a strong increase in the risk of fire associated with this dry parameter. If we step then to the high emission scenario, an emission scenario which isn't too far from the way that we continue to be dependent on fossil fuel emissions under our current economic activity, we see an even stronger increase in the projected f climate risk of fire activity across the United States. If I flip back and forth just quickly between these two, you see that overall the trend towards an increase is consistent between low emissions and high emission scenarios but that the high emission scenario gets us faster to a place where fire activity from the climate risk alone will be increasing. What our group is to do, has done next is to look at how these trends in these uh, climate models prepared for the fifth assessment report translate into burned area in three different ways. The first is to use this relationship between the historic patterns of fire, here shown on the map in the, below. This is how we've used Landsat data to map fire activity over the last 25 years. So if we look to the middle of the century, from 2050 to 2060, the projected increase in each of these regions is shown in the top panel. The first line indicates that low or middle emission scenario, and the bottom line shows a high emission scenario. And what we see is by the middle of the century, under both low and high emission scenarios, a doubling of burned area relative to current conditions across some of those principal regions of fire activity. We can look at that in a different way, which is to understand how does climate influence the risk of fire activity across these regions. And what we see in the projected uh, climate data is an increase in both the length of the fire season as well as the strength. So that trend is being driven in some regions by an earlier onset of fire or burnable conditions and a longer time period when those regions may be susceptible to fire activity. We can also look at events and 2012 has been mentioned today already, um, those extreme events where wildfires and our climate-driven wildfires are of particular concern as we think about both management and the impacts on ecosystems and livelihoods. This shows the results from two of the eight models that we looked at for our study. The top model panels show from the Hadley Center from the UK Met Office, the bottom panels from the Beijing Climate Center. Um, and these panels show the frequency of extreme events so if we look at the left-hand maps, we see that an event that occurred maybe once a decade uh, is projected to be more like three to four times per decade across some of these key burning areas by the middle of this coming century. And by the end of the century, we see a strong increase in those extreme events related to fire activity uh, across much of the continent of the United States. Each of these models shows an interesting pattern of the specific locations of those extreme events, but the overall trend towards more extreme conditions for fire activity is consistent across all models. As I mentioned before, fire is partially about how climate impacts uh, the vegetation and the risk of burning. Fires, and more and more, especially across the United States, fires are about management, and that's what we'll hear about next. Good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here. What I was trying to do is to associate active fire with management types. For that, I divide the fires into three types based on two land cover data sets you're seeing here. Red is, um, we saw, um, I also use MTBS data sets, as we saw several times in this briefing. That is the red in the, in the figure. Um, and I'd, MTBS focuses particularly on w severe wildfires. That is my first fire type. Greens are cropland of the lower 48 states. Look at how much we have here. And I define my second fire type as agricultural fires in croplands. Fires are neither um, wildfires nor agricultural fires are defined prescribed fires or other. These are fires in plantations, in grasslands, in ranchlands, or other. We quantify 10-year trends of these fires, how they fit vary year by year, how they vary within a year, and try to see how climate uh, affects these fires. 
this is the breakdown of this is the breakdown of fire components based on my approach. Most wildland fires are on the east on the west coast. Sorry, um, agricultural and prescribed fires are together 70 percent of total active fires in continental U.S. that reflect regional differences. Agricultural fires are in Central Valley of California, Washington State, North Dakota, Mississippi Valleys, and Southeast U.S. Prescribed fires are um, some of the prescribed fires on the, are on the West Coast in, um, in Kansas and the whole South and Southeast U.S. Although agricultural and prescribed fires are, have lots of differences in land use and land cover, um, land cover and land use activities, the timing of peak fire months are pretty similar, as you're seeing in the figure here. Um, they come... Um, they come, they come later in a year, um, later than wildland fire is, as you see in the top panel. What 80% of wildfires are in, occur in the summer are from June to August. That is also the dry, dry season. Agricultural fires and prescribed fires come, come later in the year, and they have a wider temporal window. 30% of them occur in the in month of September September to October, that is the harvest season. And they also occur in the spring of March to, March to May before, planti uh, before planting. Then what about the trends? These are the trends for agricultural and prescribed fires over the last 10 years. Increases are red and decreases are blue. In West Coast, agricultural fires decreased by 60% over the last 10 years. However, um, there was a compensating trend of increase of 50% in South and Southeast that made the overall trend of 30% increase across the continental US. We didn't find a strong overall trend for prescribed fires over the continental US, um, but we are seeing, as you're seeing in the bottom panel here, uh, we are seeing many, many regional increases or decreases. To know how strong climate affects the trend of agricultural fires, we perform correlation analysis between the fires and potential evaporation or the dryness. This um, on the right is the correlation, co correlation coefficients we have. Oranges are positive, positively correlated. That means when it's drier, uh, there's tendency for more fire. Greens are the opposite. As we are seeing here, Dryness is a very strong driving factor for wildland fires. That is the top panel, but not so much for agricultural fires on the bottom panel. The correlation between agricultural fires and climate is weaker, especially in the West Coast, where there is a 60% over the last 10 years. So the conclusions. About 70% of active fire detections in the US are due to management. Within them, there was a 30% overall increase in ag agricultural fires. And this increase, this trend, is less controlled by climate than wildfire is. By saying that, it means there's a greater potential to control agricultural fire emissions by regulating these fires. However, we need to consider several purposes. Um, we need to perform perform a cost-benefit benefit analysis um, to reduce fire emissions to improve public health, but at the same time, keeping high crop yield, food security, and other ecosystem fire, um, services these fires serve. Thank you very much. And um, I'm going back to the fire of this year, and for um, additional information, please go to the link. Um, down there, and you you may find a PowerPoints and uh, um, videos and more information. Thank you very much. Okay, time for questions. Um, do we have any questions here in the room? Uh, the questions for uh, members of the press, and when you do ask a question, please state your name and your media affiliation. Um, we do have a question from the internet. 
Hi, this question is from Seth Borenstein of the Associated Press. Um, he says he apologizes if this question has already been covered. He was having problems uh, watching the web streaming. But can someone, either Dr. Giglio or Dr. Williams, address again specifically just how uh, 2012 in the US fits with climate change? Uh, Dr. Williams said, he thought he said it was uh, predicted, excuse me. And can you go into that a little bit more and uh, how much carbon was likely put in the atmosphere from this fire season? I need my, thank you. Um, that's a great question. Thanks for that. Um, so one of the things I didn't have time to mention was that the National Interagency Fire Center has statistics from 1960 to 2012 about how much area has burned. And one of the things that it shows for fires up to November of 2012 is that about 9 million acres have been burned by wildfires and that this is the, the second largest on record over that period of time. The previous one was, if I'm correct, I'm, I'm not certain about this, but it was also in the 2000s, I think it was 2006. Um, and so there's clearly an indication that there has been a rise in the area burned. And corresponding with that, what our work shows for the period of 1984 to 2008 is that there's actually been a, a, a rise in step in the rate of carbon dioxide released associated with these fires. While we haven't looked at the year 2012 in specific in our particular work, I feel confident that we would find the same conclusion, that given that the area burned was remarkable in 2012, so too would be the carbon impacts. Lastly, to make the connection to climate change, it does appear as though, uh, from work that we've seen here as well as other studies, that dry years give rise to large areas burned as well as potentially more severe fires, um, and those are the ones that release the most amount of carbon. And so there is a clear connection between climate change that we've already observed as well as that which is forecast to come, a trend in dryness, a trend in burned area, and correspondingly a trend in carbon emissions that serve as a feedback to climate change itself. Um, Jonathan Amos, BBC News. Is the, are there any mitigation strategies here for forest management that need to be improved to, to try and limit the, the number of fires that are are taking place or, or have we got have we done as best as we can and and that's it basically who wants to handle that i can try and no, i'm thinking fire breaks and all that <clears> kind of stuff the way that we manage our forests so that you know we can we can stop the fires quicker easier and all the rest of it. certainly well there's a, a the work you've seen today looks at the direct impacts of burning on carbon emissions and the link between those the fire risk and climate activities particularly how dry the atmosphere is demand for the water is, which sort of integrates the impacts of lower rainfall, uh, warmer temperatures, lower relative humidity, or higher wind speeds, in a single metric that looks at fire risk. Um, and what we see is actually a pretty consistent trend. So when we have fire weather conditions, whether it's in the western U.S., whether it's in Australia or Greece or the South American arc of deforestation, those dry conditions are associated with an increase in burning, not independent of management, but when the risk of fires is so high, as we've seen across the West this year and these other regions in, in very recent years, there is little that is um, controllable in terms of management. Any ignition source will do, whether that's a lightning strike or an accidental fire caused by human activity. In the specific case of forest management, uh, we have a long history in the U.S. of forest management aimed at both uh, timber production and reducing risk of fire activity. Um, that's a, an activity that's ongoing. I don't know that I could suggest one specific management practice that would reduce the risk of fires across the U.S. forests or other regions of fire-prone forests. Um, I think what we're working towards and what builds on the analyses we've shown today is, a, is an effort to understand the patterns of fire weather, to better predict and forecast those circumstances which lead to high fire activity, and in doing so, reduce the risk of, of ignitions rather than reducing the, the loads of fuels in our forests. Okay, we have a follow-up question from Seth Borenstein. Is it fair to say uh, what we saw in the 2012 fire season was what IPCC and others have warned about? And he's just looking for a concise sentence saying yes or no, if this was something that you could say scientists had seen coming. Okay, <laughs> so uh, I'll take that question again. Um, I'm not gonna give a yes or no answer. Sorry, Seth. Um, what I can say is that 
the trends that we see in fire activity as well as carbon emissions are consistent with what we would expect with continued rise and dryness across regions that are already flammable. Okay, do we have any other questions here in the room? There's one in the back, I believe. Hi, I'm Molly Samuel from KQED News. I've got um, two questions. One is um, following up from the, the BBC question, if you could talk more about fire suppression and if different forest management practices um, could change the, the trends that we're seeing. And the other is um, instances of lightning strikes in, in the West and if you're seeing trends um, in, in lightning going up or any trend at all. So uh, I'll just try to continue on with what Doug was already telling us. Um, one of the interesting things that we see now going on is that uh, management activities that are currently taking place are, uh, I would suggest, are likely to become less effective as the climate changes and conditions become increasingly dry. The challenge here is that we've got a changing backdrop of fire activity and fire risk. With climate changes that are forecast and to some degree that we've seen take, taking place so far, um, we can expect that management activities are going to be challenged even further to s limit fire activity. Uh, there's an aspect of fuel associated with uh, forest flammability, um, and some of that's related to uh, the climate change itself. Um, for the most part, I think that um, we can expect management activities to be less effective if the trends in dryness that are forecast come to pass. More questions? I guess this was a, a follow-up to the, to the last question. This is Carolyn Gramley from Science Magazine. Um, what about the instances of lightning strikes? Have you seen any trends in that? Oh, uh, um, yeah, sorry, I forgot about that one. Uh, no, I've not done a, uh, a detailed study, but I have seen some, uh, some numbers. And no, I, there's nothing that leads me to believe this is just due to uh, increased lightning or anything like that. I'd say worldwide, the most important source of fire ignitions are humans, and I think that's true um, in both recent time periods. The risk that we're talking about here is really just the climate risk. Maybe to put one more um, point on what Chris was mentioning earlier, um, as we look into the future, in particular out to 50 or 100 years, the vegetation and the climate uh, will evolve together. And so areas that today have lots of fuel because they're a standing forest um, 100 years from now may not have the sufficient rainfall to grow a forest on those same sites. And so as fire increases, Vegetation will also be responding to climate at the same time. And so the challenge for us looking forward is not just to look at how climate will become more suitable for fire, but how climate and vegetation will co-vary as we move towards the end of the century. Other questions from press here in the room? Okay, that's it for this uh, press conference. Thank you very much, panelists, for your uh, presentations and thanks everyone else for being here and asking questions. Our next press conference is at 10.30 a.m. It is um, Mars Rover Opportunity Investigations at the Endeavour Crater.